One of the biggest criticisms that we get with regard to the radioelastic model of the atom that we are trying to develop here on this channel is the question of how, if these atoms are radially organized and these little filaments of their shells are extending outward to other atoms, how can an atom move through space and thus transect with its filaments the filaments of all of the atoms in the vicinity? such that it's able to continue to conduct light across these filaments without disturbance. And of course, gravity, the tension of gravity is maintained. This is a huge problem, and we've talked about it a bit in previous conversations, and we always point to analogies with self-healing polymers, things like fascia in the skin, and we've showed some videos of how these individual filaments of the fascia inside of your body, the, the connective tissue under your skin, is able to move past one another while maintaining tension. So there are some analogs for this, and we've brainstormed how the fibers might rearrange in order to provide for this transit event. But we came across a really interesting effect during a phone call we were having with one of our friends, an emeritus professor at Caltech named Carver Mead, who we've had on the podcast before. Not on this channel, but on the Demystify Sci podcast. And Carver was talking about the Shapiro effect. And we were puzzling over explaining the Shapiro effect after the phone call with regard to our model of the atom. And Anastasia came up with a really insightful possibility for how this could be happening and what it might tell us about this filamentary transit phenomenon, which we've been struggling with for so long. And I really think that this explanation illuminates how this transit event might be orchestrated. But first, we need to understand what the Shapiro effect is. Shapiro was a guy who was able to bounce radio signals off of the rocky planet. So he could send a radio pulse to Mars and have that radio pulse come back to his observatory on Earth. I think that he was using the Arecibo Observatory and one other one. And he was doing this experiment where he would, every single day of the year, he would bounce the signal off of Mars and look at the amount of time that it took for it to return to Earth. And something that he noticed as Mars moved so that it was on the far side of the sun from Earth, but before it was completely occluded. So there's basically the radio signal is passing past the sun as it goes to Mars. He discovered that there was an excess delay in the signal. And if you look at conventional explanations of this, this is obviously a readout of the bending of space-time, and so you have this space-time warping that is affecting the transit path of the light because suddenly the light is following a curved path and that path is longer, and so it takes more time for it to get between Earth and Mars because of the gravity well. We don't buy that explanation on material atomics, and so we started thinking about it after we got off the phone with Carver, which is like, okay, what could possibly be causing an increase in the length of time that it takes for the signal to bounce. And so one of the options is that the signal gets relayed through the sun, right? Well, yeah, that was my first thought was, okay, well, obviously some of the light is going through the atmosphere of the sun and it's dealing with those atoms. And by dealing with this huge mass of atoms, maybe it's putting some tension on the lines, essentially. But then my thought was, if it's putting tension on the lines, that actually should speed up the signal not slow it down. And so I was left scratching my head. And Anastasia started thinking about, well, there's all these filaments in the vicinity of the sun. Maybe those are interfering with the signal somehow. And at first I'm just like, what? No, this is crazy. I mean, how we don't have any means in our model by which light signals can interfere with one another just by filaments being in the vicinity. And then she started to think about the transit problem and things started to make a lot more sense. The way that I think about it is that you have filaments from the Earth that are impinging on Mars that are carrying the photon, right? So the photon is this action that's inside the filament. And as Mars moves closer and closer to the sun, you're crossing a greater and greater cross-section of the sun's filaments. Because if you're at a distance from the sun, they're radially arranged, and so you're going to have fewer filaments to cross in a given cross-sectional area of space. Okay, so way more filaments close to the sun than you would farther away, but how do you deal with the fact that light is slowing down but not necessarily changing its wavelength? Because if you're talking about increasing or decreasing tension, if you think about a guitar string, 
as you loosen the tension on the guitar string, you get a larger wavelength. If you tighten the tension on the guitar string, you get a smaller wavelength. And so you would expect the frequency of the light to change, but that's not what we're seeing in these radio waves. We're literally just seeing a time delay in arrival. So tension has to be maintained as these filaments carrying photons cross the filaments of the sun. And I was like, okay, well, if two filaments cross, is it possible that there's a momentary... I, the easiest way to describe it is like a vortex where basically the a, a rearrangement right it has to there's a rearrangement moment there's a rearrangement moment but the rearrangement has to happen in such a way where you maintain a shell of the filament material that can carry the tension that's in the filaments coming from the sun and leaving the sun so as the filament carrying the photon impinges on a filament that's leaving the sun, there's this momentary like cloud that forms there. And the cloud is, is, is formed in such a, a way... A cloud of fiber, right? A cloud of fiber. And so it's almost like a, a teeny, teeny, tiny little atom. Because I think that the atom has a similar structure, except for the fact that it has this surface motion and this involution... But this isn't big enough, and it isn't complex enough. It's literally just this momentary tangle where the, fi the filaments have to rearrange into their fibers, and then that motion, that momentum, is then passed onto the other end of the filament that leaves that rearrangement. And then at each intersection of filament to filament, it has to rearrange again. And these are tiny, tiny rearrangements, because Shapiro saw a maximum of like a 200 microsecond delay. So it's not a lot of time. And that way, the rearrangements aren't very big. They're not very long. It's literally just this momentary chaos as it kicks over past the filament. Yeah, 200 microseconds. If you think about the gazillions of filaments that must be extending from all of the atoms on the sun outward, those are all of the transits that are potentially necessary for one filament from Mars or something like that, right? So you're talking about numbers which are too big for words almost of filaments that this event needs to happen through we and could probably do a back of the envelope calculation to figure out what that would look like or how many of those would be i mean we don't know how many filaments one atom has right now and uh, say a hydrogen right it's we haven't figured that out any way of deducing that yet but if we did know the number of filaments per atom hydrogen and the sun's being mostly hydrogen we could calculate that but needless to say it's an outrageous number of transit events that need to happen just for a single filament reaching from mars to that radio receiver here on earth and then you add up all the filaments from mars that are being received all the photons that are being received at that radio receiver and you're talking about a ridiculous number of rearrangement events that could add up appreciably on the microsecond level more importantly, I think that those rearrangements are happening all the time. Like when you move your hand and you're rearranging the position of your hand's atoms relative to the room, there are these transits that are happening, but they're so small and so imperceptible that you need a star-sized object with a signal passing it in order to actually start to detect it. And so this is kind of a way that we can look at celestial events and start to think about, okay, well, we know that we have to be able to transit filaments, and we know that there must be some detectable effect. And I think that the Shapiro delay is the effect of filament transit on a cosmic scale. Yeah, I think this is the first empirical evidence for filamentary transit that we have. And none of the other explanations make sense in terms of why they call it gravitational delay, but it really doesn't have a lot to do with gravitation. It has to do with the presence of a large mass of filaments in one place, essentially, which are causing the interference. So I'm just really, really excited about this idea. Props to you for coming up with it. And we need to keep an eye out for other phenomena that could highlight details about this transit event so we can learn more about it. So hey, what you guys can do for us is when you're out in the world and you come across weird phenomena that people are trying to explain to you using either the bending of space-time or spooky quantum stuff, send us an email. We're at demystifysci at gmail.com and we will... Or leave a comment. Or leave a comment. I mean, comments are great too. But find a way to tell us so that we can look into it and start to give the things that you're curious about material atomics explanations. 
That's it for this week. Tell us what you think. Leave a comment. Send us an email. Tell your friends. See you next time.